National parks are excellent natural laboratories. They are that because we protected them. We protected the natural processes and the landscapes way back when, when these parks were set aside in a place like Yosemite. The science that is conducted in our national parks is gonna have major impact on our future. There's nothing that replicates what the national parks uh, provide for the kinds of scientists we have here thinking about really critical issues. Global climate change has emerged as one of the greatest challenges that faces the world. Published research from U.S. national parks has shown how climate is melting glaciers, increasing tree mortality, and shifting vegetation around the world. How can we build resilience in our high elevation meadows, for example, when we know that there's change happening in snowmelt, groundwater availability, soil moisture? Science can help us understand that change, but also help us figure out ways to build resiliency and resistance to that change. So for example, one of our main projects right now that's in Yosemite National Park is trying to help the Park Service understand how different populations of endangered frogs are related to each other and whether it would be appropriate to move them from place to place or to reestablish them in places that they've been extinct. And so that's an example of how science can really help a park make good decisions about an important natural resource. You can do simulations, you can build models, but you can't actually understand the myriad interconnections of the natural world unless you're able to have top scientists working over extended periods of time in spaces that are large enough to show some of the measurable effects of some of the changes that are happening in the world. Parks certainly provide an inspiration for science. Even in my own case where I was already dedicated to become a biologist, my specific research was inspired by visiting a park. That also speaks to why most scientists are doing the science they're doing is because of a love of nature and inspiration in landscapes like this. And so if you look at the science that's happening in parks, a lot of it is happening high up in the treetops, you know, on the peaks of mountains. It's not happening in a laboratory. So it is here that more and more scientists will be coming to solve mysteries. And they won't be people in white coats, and they won't be nerds who look like they've never stepped out in the sunshine. They will be adventurous. That real science includes ventures into the natural world to discover and solve mysteries. Good evening. Welcome to Berkeley and our Science for Parks, Parks for Science, the Next Century Summit. Great film, uh, but I'd have to say outdoor nerds are the coolest nerds. <laughs> and almost everyone in this room is an outdoor nerd. Um, that film really set the stage for the next three days. I'm Keith Gillis, Dean of the College of Natural Resources here at Berkeley, 
and the college's faculty, students, staff, alumni, they've all done an exceptional job of organizing this summit, and I could not be more proud of their efforts. That said, we couldn't have pulled this off alone. It wouldn't have been possible without our partners. The National Park Service, who helped produce the video you just enjoyed, the National Geographic Society, and our media sponsor, KQED. I'd also like to thank our Horace uh, M. Albright level sponsor, the Save the Redwoods League, and our Joseph Grinnell level sponsors, the Nature Conservancy, the Yosemite Conservancy, the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, East Bay Regional Parks District, and LSA Associates. Thank you to all of you. Finally, a uh, warm thank you to our donor in kind, Canoogle, who created the Campus Tree app that you can access via the program app for this, uh, this summit. So this summit builds on the historic linkage between UC Berkeley and the National Park Service, a relationship that contributed in both directions to two of America's best ideas, national parks and public education. Much of the inspiration for and perspiration that produced the National Park Service came from a conference that was held at UC Berkeley a century ago this March. Berkeley alumni Stephen Mather, Horace Albright, and Mark Daniels brought together park administrators and rangers, scientists, conservationists, and business leaders to catalyze a campaign for a federal park service. Mather was the first of three Berkeley alumni who led the National Park Service in its early years. Over the next two decades, UC Berkeley functioned as a key research partner for, of the national parks, leading biological surveys, training many students who went on to play prominent roles in the National Park Service. You'll hear more about this in a minute. And now, a century later, our summit brings us together not just to celebrate the centennial, but to try and make a difference in park stewardship for the future. The world's changed beyond the imagination of even the visionary leadership that created the National Park Service. Our state, national, and regional parks are all facing tremendous challenges that will only intensify over the next decades. We're pleased that you, the leaders of today, and you are the leaders who stand in the place of the people that met in Berkeley a century ago, uh, came together at this summit to discuss critical issues for the success of the National Park Service over the next century. Thank you for being here and thank you for your intellectual input to this summit. Now, I'm pleased to introduce Steve Beisinger, uh, Professor of Conservation Biology and Chair of the Faculty Summit Organizing Committee, who will set the stage for our summit by telling us about Berkeley's rich historical connections to the National Park Service. Steve? Gosh, thank you, Keith, and welcome, everyone. It's great to see you here. But let's not stay here for long. I'm hoping we can take a trip back through time together to look at what life was like and think about the birth of America's two best ideas. Here in Berkeley, California, the home of America's preeminent public university, national parks, and public education. Berkeley was founded in 1868, and shortly thereafter that, Joseph LeConte was hired as an early geologist, natural history, and botany professor, he became co-founder of the Sierra Club and an early researcher in Yosemite. Twice the campus was visited by Teddy Roosevelt. In 1903, he gave a commencement speech just um, about 250 meters from here in the Greek theater before setting out with John Muir, a naturalist, to camp at Yosemite, and in fact then taking Yosemite in as a national park. It was a state park before that. His Charter Day speech in 1911 inspired a young Horace Albright. And it was Albright, along with Mather, that were credited with founding the National Park Service. Mather was a businessman. He was selling 20 mule team borax, before Ronald Reagan got into the act, I should say. And Mather, if he was going to build a park service, he had to get it past this man. He was working for Franklin Lane, the Secretary of the Interior. Lane, in his early years, had pretty strong philosophy about wilderness. A wilderness, no matter how impressive and beautiful, doesn't satisfy this soul of mine, if I had that kind of thing. 
It's a challenge to man. It says, master me. Put me to use. Make me something more than I am. Well, turns out that Lane had been a Berkeley student too. We have to own up to this. <laughs> um, but he was a Berkeley dropout. <laughs> All right, he didn't graduate. He only spent two years here. He left, he became a reporter. He then became a lawyer. He then became a politician and that slippery slope to administrator. <laughs> so what happened next is unfortunate. He was in there signing the papers when Hetch Hetchy Valley was flooded in Yosemite. Uh, a national park with a dam and now a flooded area in it. So Mather had to get his ideas past that. Meanwhile, back in Berkeley, back in Berkeley, um, we bring together in March 1915 uh, a group of 75 men who are park administrators, rangers, businessmen, scientists, politicians, conservationists, for perhaps the first conference on national parks. They met for two days just down the street in California Hall. That's the home of our chancellor now. They, Mather arranged it all. He put them up in the Sigma Chi fraternity house. That's where he had been a brother on College Avenue where they bonded over liquid refreshments. <laughs> now today's Sigma Chi house has to learn the history. And I was told by their president, all the brothers know who Stephen Mather is as part of their, um, as part of their training. And I was told by the president they still use liquid refreshment for bonding. <laughs> all right, here's this two day meeting. It starts off with another Berkeley grad, Mark Daniels. He was the first, nation's first superintendent and landscape engineer for parks. Interesting title. He believed that economics and aesthetics go hand in hand. Wow, pretty forward looking for that time. And he believed that the way to develop parks was to take advantage of the inexhaustible commercial resources of scenery. Wow. All right, later in that year, after this two-day conference in June, Mather and Albright gather another group of 15 influential Americans. They spend a two-week trip on the Sierra Nevada mountains, dubbed the Mather Mountain Party. It included people like Gilbert Grosvenor, the young editor of the National Geographic Society and magazine, politicians, businessmen, and railroad builders. I gotta say, here they are on top of Mount Whitney, the highest point in Eastern North America. You know, they didn't look as good as those foresters and rangers coming into Berkeley, did they? They were not traveling in, in style then, but that trip bonded them. And they went out and conducted a tremendous campaign to create the National Park Service in 1916, whose centennial we celebrate next year in 2016. And then the rest was history, as they say. Mather, the first director, presided over the professionalization and expansion of the Park Service. Albright worked closely with Mather, put the Park Service together, then went to Yellowstone to become a superintendent, then Yosemite, before he became the second director of the National Park Service. But Berkeley's legacy was not really just in launching the National Park Service, participating in that launch. A lot of people take, take some pride in that. But what's really interesting is the influence that happened after that. And none of it would have been possible without a, 20, without a Hawaiian sugar heiress, Annie Alexander. A 33-year-old Alexander starts attending lectures here in Berkeley on the campus and becomes inspired to become a vertebrate zoologist and paleontologist. Who knew? But she founded the Berkeley Museum of Vertebrate Zoology and named Joseph Grinnell as its first director. She financially supported work there and in the university's Museum of Paleontology. With her companion, Louise Kellogg, they collected over 22,000 vertebrate, fossil, and plant specimens throughout the West in many locations that would become national parks. They did this because they knew that the indigenous flora and fauna were disappearing. Another woman well ahead of her time. Now Grinnell recognized this too. And he realized that California in its rapid changing required documentation. So he developed inventories 
of birds and mammals throughout Yosemite starting in 1915, eventually surveying all of what would become the national parks in California while developing his ideas about how climate shapes ecological niches of plants and animals. He was also a strong proponent of the use and role of science in park management. We're fortunate tonight to be joined by two of Joseph Grinnell's uh, grandchildren, June and Richard, and two of his great-grandchildren, Rick O'Dell and Paul Bryant. Would you please stand so you can be acknowledged Thank you. You know, Grinnell's, Grinnell's other legacy was that he trained many people who would go on to become prominent leaders and biologists in the National Park Service. Tracy Storer was one of those. He worked with Grinnell in the surveys in the Sierras and Yosemite and elsewhere, became an influential faculty member at UC Davis, had strong views on the practice of shooting predators at that time. Harold Bryant, was an outstanding researcher. He got his PhD in economic ornithology. I'm an ornithologist, I'm proud of that. Today, we call that ecosystem services. Another person well ahead of his time, there was a branch of that. He not only helped set up research in the Park Service, but he was very proud of establishing its interpretive program. Ansel Hall graduated in forestry from Cal went on to become the first park ranger in Sequoia National Park, the first chief naturalist, and the first chief forester, and was involved in setting up the early museum in Yosemite. I believe we're fortunate tonight to have a number of Ansel, Ansel's uh, family here with us, in particular Robert Hall and Sandy Weiss. Would you please stand? Robert is Ansel's son. and his partner, Sandy. We're so pleased we can acknowledge you. George Melendez Wright, another Berkeley grad, started the National Park Service Wildlife Division with his own funds in 1926, and for many years operated it out of Hillgard Hall. Joseph Dixon and Ben Thompson, also Berkeley grads, worked with Wright to conduct the first formal survey of wildlife in national parks called Fauna One. Fauna number one became the Bible for the National Park Service biologists. Wright died early in his career in a tragic car crash, but Dixon and Thompson went on to produce many subsequent research works for their park service in their long and distinguished careers. A society devoted to park stewardship bears Wright's name, and we invited the George Wright Society to co-locate their biannual meeting next week in Oakland. We're fortunate tonight to be joined by some members of the Wright family. Um, could you please stand to be acknowledged? I believe you're, you're all here, fantastic, <laughs> through the traffic. <laughs> Pam, Pamela Wright Lloyd, his daughter, granddaughters, Catherine Lloyd Rice, Jean Carol Lloyd Emery, her husband, Jerry Emery, who works for California State Parks, two grandsons and three great-grandchildren. So thank you for bearing through the Bay Area traffic and making it here. Um, finally, two other giants in the field of park service science have had strong Berkeley connections. Newton Drury was the executive director of Save the Redwoods League before he became the fourth director of the National Park Service in 1940. Uh, we'll hear more about this remarkable man from Sam Hodder, the current director of Save the Redwoods League, when he speaks to us shortly. A. Starker Leopold was Aldo Leopold's eldest child and a giant in his own right in wildlife conservation. Starker did his PhD here at Cal and returned to become a professor in wildlife ecology for 30 years. His 1963 report guided the management of national parks for 50 years until it was revisited by a recent effort in the Park Service. So today at Berkeley, we're fortunate to carry on this tradition, and we stand on the shoulders and sometimes literally walk in the footsteps of our predecessors, as we've done on the Grinnell Resurvey Project, where we've tried to resurvey birds and mammals where Grinnell and his colleagues first sampled them in national parks in California to understand the effects of climate change on species distribution. 
Berkeley is the home of top-ranked departments and faculties in environmental science, ecology, evolution, and important collections in our Berkeley Natural History Museums. Berkeley faculty and students and alumni are still doing cutting-edge work for management of parks and in lands outside of parks to produce key data and insights for conservation and management. Our research on social, cultural, and health benefits of parks contributes to understanding the barriers and benefits of park use. But we realize that we're really part of a much larger academic community, which is why we invited you here tonight. And we are all concerned about the scientific and the challenges facing parks. Our national, state, and regional parks are affected by a changing climate, storms and fires of greater frequency, urban encroachment and pollution, invasions of non-native species, plant and animal extinctions, changing attitudes of a public that has become more urbanized, and political pressures of narrow interest groups that have sometimes led to benign neglect of parks. So we convene this summit to celebrate our history and to focus on the future, to focus on science that is relevant to parks and protected areas in the US and worldwide. We invited 30 plenary speakers and discussants, mostly academics from other institutions, to engage with us on key subjects, led by Edward O. Wilson and Jane Lubchenco. The plenary sessions are complemented by over 200 contributed oral and poster presentations. Tomorrow night for our annual Albright Lecture, we invited Secretary of Interior Sally Jewell, UC President Janet Napolitano, and historian Douglas Brinkley to discuss America's two best ideas with us, public lands and public education, to remind us of the importance of the public good. We chose to focus this summit on science, science writ large, biological science, physical science, and social science, as applied to the problems of parks and protected areas. Why science? Because when it's done well, it produces important insights and important and unbiased information that we can use to manage and think about the problems that we face. Why emphasize the voice of academics? Because the academy is a place of free discourse and because conversations about difficult subjects often begin here first. I hope this summit will stimulate new ideas, create new partnerships, and refocus our attention on the role that science can play for our, for our parks. Thank you very much. Oops. It's either you or Thank you, Steve, both for that great foundation for what we're doing here, but for all the work you did leading up to this. Um, I'd now like to welcome to the stage uh, Sam Hodder, Executive Director of Save the Redwood League. Sam. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. I'm Sam Hodder, uh, President and CEO of Save the Redwoods League. I'm thrilled to be here today and proud to help introduce this terrific uh, conference and celebration. Um, because that fateful meeting 100 years ago also played an important chapter uh, in the story of Save the Redwoods League. And I will speak today about that entwined history, how the integration of science and parks is core to our DNA, core to the conservation community, and critical for our shared future. A hundred years ago, America's greatest idea was taking shape here in Berkeley. And what a meeting that must have been. You have to imagine uh, whether or not they realized what an impact they were going to have into the future, and whether they realized that they were helping to shape the conservation movement of the 20th century, or whether they realized that they were initiating the, the rescue of some of America's most special places. That meeting happened at a time when America's relationship with their landscape was evolving. And nowhere was that change more tangible and more compelling than in the redwoods of Northern California. The rapid disappearance of the ancient redwoods was the clarion call for the movement moving forward. 
These natural cathedrals had grown to be emblematic of the American landscape, and their devastation provided the momentum behind the early conservation movement. In this dramatic contrast between the inspirational beauty and landscape scale devastation, the creation of a third innovation, uh, that is, of the nonprofit organizations that helped to accelerate conservation and research in the parks was born. So I'll do a quick ancestry.com type analysis of the lineage that helps to illustrate that linkage between uh, Save the Redwoods League, uh, Berkeley, and the National Park Service. As has been mentioned, Stephen Mather, father of the National Park Service, but in 1917, shortly after uh, the Park Service was established, uh, he encouraged uh, three scientists, all linked to Berkeley, uh, to go up and investigate the redwoods of Northern California. It was shortly after the 101 highway had been built, and he encouraged them to witness what was happening in the redwoods. And their experience there, both witnessing the grandeur of the Redwoods and the devastation that was taking place, inspired them to establish Save the Redwoods League the next year. And uh, Stephen Mather was a founding uh, member of our board of counselors and uh, one of the first official actions of uh, Save the Redwoods League as an organization was to hire Newton Drury as our first executive director. And Newton Drury went on to lead our organization for the next 56 years. He took an 11, that's a lot to live up to. <laughs> Let's all acknowledge that. Uh, and he had just recently graduated from Berkeley, I think in 1912. And so he was a young man when he took the job and he uh, took an 11 year leave of absence uh, to be the director of the National Park Service and also served as the director of California State Parks for a time. Uh, another key collaborator in those early years was John C. Merriam. And he was part of that expedition in 1917 to go uh, see what was happening in the Redwoods. He was the paleontology chair here at Berkeley uh, and helped, uh, was a major contributor in developing uh, the educational programs at the National Park Service. And he was chair of Save the Redwoods League Board of Directors for our first 25 years. The three of them, together with others, really helped to establish the early philosophy of our conservation organization. And because this was a time when there was no land trust movement, it wouldn't come for another 50 years. There had been no silent spring from Rachel Carson. There was no, uh, there, there was no infrastructure around the conservation movement. So their philosophy of finding the dual balance and the shared priorities of both protecting the most special places for their own sake but also because of the critical value that those places gave to us as human communities. That was core to their belief from the beginning. They believed in our parks as classrooms, that our parks had great scientific and educational potential, that research in wilderness parks would prove critical to our understanding of ourselves and of our world. A hundred years after that transformational meeting here at Berkeley, we and together with our partners have helped to assemble a world-class network of redwood parks in California. And our foundation of science has stayed true through our conservation activity ever since. As a demonstration of that commitment to science, Save the Redwoods League, oh, went too fast. Save the Redwoods League has committed uh, $4.2 million to research in our parks in the last 10 years alone. Currently, how about that? Yeah. Currently, Save the Redwoods League is advancing uh, a collaborative science project with, with Berkeley and, and Humboldt State University. Uh, scientists that are advancing our Redwoods and Climate Change Initiative. The team is studying a network of old growth plots that are distributed throughout the Redwood Range in state and national parks. And by studying forest growth uh, and measuring it in the plots over time, we're learning how climate change is impacting the forest. There have been some incredible discoveries along the way. This science project has, uh, has taught us, we've learned that the old growth redwood forests sequester more carbon than any other forest on the planet. By a long shot, second place isn't anywhere near it. A plot in Redwood National and State Park up on the north coast of California is the world record holder for above ground biomass. More than 5,000 metric tons of biomass per hectare. It is the most carbon-rich forest on the planet. Some of these trees are growing at a rate of 1.6 cubic meters of wood per year. That is nearly 2,000 pounds of wood on a single tree in a single year. Extraordinary. 
And because the redwoods are so resistant to decay, the carbon in redwood forest stays sequestered for centuries. Through research programs like the Redwoods and Climate Change Initiative, we are letting the ancient trees answer very current questions. We're learning every day that parks can teach us about today's environmental challenges. We're learning how to better save and steward these special places. And we're learning how these special places are saving us. Knowing what we know now, we can make better decisions about forest management, about where our scarce conservation dollars should be spent, about recreational access, and about making our parks more relevant to today's Californian, today's American, today's visitors. Now, I have a confession to make. Uh, I was an English major. <laughs> um, maybe there are a couple of us here in the room who have a support group we can sign up in the back. Um, <laughs> But indulge me to give the non-scientists redwood groupie perspective on why science in our parks is more important than ever. We've done some research in reaching out to California Visitors Bureau, and it's remarkable that we've learned that one out of every two visitors that call the California Visitors Bureau asks how to get to the redwoods. Our Redwoods and Climate Change Initiative study that I just described, when, uh, when the release went out about our findings, it was covered in papers in every country of the world but three. Millions of people will visit Muir Woods, Mariposa Grove, Redwood National and State Parks in the coming months alone. Our national and state parks, and particularly our Redwood Parks, draw people from around the world. These forests are every bit as enchanting and as inspiring as they were when we put the redwood tree on the National Park Service logo. And when they get there, whether they're scientists or English majors or anything in between, visitors are forever changed. Our parks are a classroom to a global student body. Our parks bring people together. They find blank pages in all of us, opening our minds to new things and giving hope when things feel too far gone. The more we learn, the more value we find in our parks. And with every new challenge we face, we find answers in the forests, rivers, deserts, and mountains that our predecessors have saved for us. It's happening right here in our backyard, in what's now Redwood Regional Park, just as an example of how accessible and inspiring these places can be. In just a few generations, we saw this forest come back from the brink. In the 1800s and several times since, the redwoods of the East Bay which are believed to have been some of the largest trees in the world, were cut down to the stump, completely eliminated, to build the cities of Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco. But out of those stumps are growing new redwood trees. I've watched as my own kids and many others have walked under these potentially third generation redwood trees every bit as inspired as when uh, they walk among the old growth. These are the very same trees that we cut down a few generations ago, sprouting up again, pulling carbon from the air like there's no tomorrow, and inspiring a next generation of visitors. That tenacity, that resiliency, speaks to the determination of nature and the irrepressibility of beauty. It gives hope to the people walking under those trees. And if we bolster that hope with a little information, just even a taste of some of the lessons that we've learned from our research in the parks, then people feel empowered until maybe things aren't so hopeless and maybe there is something that we can do about the daunting changes that we see in the world. And so the commitment to science and conservation and innovation that was born here a hundred years ago continues to change the world. And as we celebrate that great idea, let's ask what our innovation will be for the next century. Our opportunity this week and going forward is to challenge ourselves to make the most of that greatest idea, to learn the lessons that our parks are teaching us, and to innovate once again in how we share those lessons with the world. Thank you, and have a fantastic conference. Good job. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Uh, our next speaker will be Chris Johns, Chief Content Officer for the National Geographic Society. Uh, we're welcoming Chris back to Berkeley. Uh, some of you may remember his 2010 Horace Albright lecture where he gave us a sneak peek of the upcoming water issue of National Geographic at the David Brower Center. Thanks for being with us again, Chris.
Thank you, Keith. It's a wonderful pleasure to be back in Berkeley. I bring greetings from Gary Nell and the staff at National Geographic. We are absolutely delighted to be partnering with the National Park Service, with the University of California, uh, to bring the summit to life. Stephen Mather was an inspirational man. He certainly inspired the first editor of National Geographic magazine, Gilbert H. Grosvenor. Following the Mather Mountain party trip that Mr. Grosvenor photographed and had the pleasure of being on, he decided to devote an entire issue of National Geographic magazine to the land of the best. So in April of 1916, he published that issue, gave it to every member of Congress, and lo and behold, he lobbied along with many distinguished people from the University of California and throughout the, what was to be the National Park Service. And on August 25th, the, Rakes, Smoot, the Raker Smoot Bill was passed. That's the power of persuasion and the power of media. National Geographic went on immediately after that to give $80,000 to help the National Park Service get on his feet. We immediately helped expand Sequoia National Park. In time, we helped create Redwood National Park. The park I live next to today in 1935, Shenandoah National Park, the first 1,000 acres was purchased for that park by the National Geographic Society. That's just to name a few of the contributions we've made in something we believe in, the national parks. We went on internationally to help create Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania and Gabon National Parks as well. So here we are, 100 years later, and National Geographic will have the largest editorial initiative in its 127-year history. This fall, National Geographic Wild, our television channel, domestic and international, will do a series of shows on Yellowstone. The National Geographic Channel in 2016 will do a series on the National Park Service. National Geographic Maps, National Geographic Kids, National Geographic Traveler Magazine, National Geographic Digital Media, our Books Division, our education division with programs like BioBlitz, led by my outstanding colleague, John Francis, who's here with us today, will be leaning in to celebrating the centennial. National Geographic Magazine will do an article every month on the national parks, and in May of 2016, we'll do an issue devoted entirely to the Yellowstone ecosystem, all 20 million acres. Gary Nell, our CEO, has a new mission statement for us, and it's called, We Believe in the Power of Science, Exploration, and Storytelling. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's December, late December, just after Christmas. Dave Halleck, the chief of Yellowstone Center for Resources, is clearing out his office. It's full of boxes. He turns to David Qualman arguably the world's finest science writer who's writing our Yellowstone issue, he lives in Bozeman. And Dave Halleck turns to Dave Quammen and says, Dave, I'm afraid we're losing this place. Well, as one who grew up near Yellowstone in the Pacific Northwest, when Dave told me that quote, it got my attention. So for the, about two weeks ago, I interviewed five people who are on the front lines at Yellowstone. We'll show uh, those interviews, the Yellowstone project that will be in May of 2016 is still a work in progress. We're just over half done. We'll show you some video, some images, and we'll, you'll hear from five remarkable people, beginning with Caroline Bird, Executive Director of the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, Dave Halleck, and three others. So if we could roll the video, please. 
We love this place because it is iconic and unique and really awe-inspiring. I felt like some days uh, at Yellowstone, I was really afraid that we were on the brink of, of slowly losing some of the things that made the ecosystem special. National parks, by definition, are islands. They're islands of protected areas surrounded by oceans of human impact. In some ways, it's Yellowstone hasn't been healthier than right now in a long time in terms of the number of uh, grizzly bears, wolves, bison expanding outside of the park. On others, in terms of its preeminence in people's minds and attitudes about wild nature, I think maybe we're losing that. All of these stressors from development, from water utilization, from exotic species proliferation, and from climate change are threatening everything that has been done to bring it to that point. So there's uh, a lot that has been done, but there's also a lot to lose. When Yellowstone Park was first created back in 1872, the American public, we didn't really know why we were creating it. And protecting wildlife was not one of the major purposes, and doing science was certainly not one of the major purposes. But we've discovered over the years that Yellowstone needs science for proper management, and at the same time, Yellowstone represents a huge opportunity in which science can be done that's applicable in other places. Yellowstone is a really lucky park, and it's lucky because we have had the, uh, the opportunity to bring in a cadre of scientists. But the quality of that science really drove our success in conservation on a number of decisions. And we all know that science is only one of the factors that's associated with park management and decision making. But when the park, uh, in some occasions, has the ability to have a lot of that science and to know that it's high quality and to know that it's objective, they are in a position to affect conservation like they would be uh, in, in no other way. I also think back about the bear bathtub, and from a scientific perspective, it had never been documented on film. And then the behavior itself, the apparent scent marking and other things that were going on, is something that had never been documented. social tolerance for living with wild animals and embracing living with wild animals. There's a lot more to understanding the social side of, of the system. And uh, it's my sense that many scientists these days are really focusing on what we call socio-ecological systems. And that is recognizing that sustainable conservation of these protected areas can only occur if it's done with a body of science and study and integration that is commensurate with the ecological study and data production so that we can better understand the effects of restoration of a carnivore, for example, on uh, the way people make a living uh, outside of protected areas. Understanding those things in greater detail and with more rigorous science, I believe, is the key to the future of conservation. I see a, certainly a growing consciousness among parts of the population of deeply caring and understanding more about our natural wild landscapes. In many places in our society, we lack a connection back to the natural world. It's the, the loss of that connection to what's real and that 
is the potential demise of our society and so I certainly don't want that for my children and I hope that they grow up with a deep connection to the real and natural world and I hope that they always have that to come back to. A park once protected is not protected forever. And we have continued to, not just to find new ways of protecting Yellowstone and better ways of protecting Yellowstone, but new ways of valuing Yellowstone. Our job is to take this wild heart of North America, protect it, enhance it, and make sure everybody knows that we have now to make sure we have it for the future. Probably more than anything, there's really an opportunity that I think uh, must be seized and it must be seized quickly. And that is to coordinate among all of the private landowners uh, and the federal and state land management agencies to develop a common set of objectives regarding what land managers would like the ecosystem to be in the future and to find ways to work collaboratively on meeting those objectives. The creation of Yellowstone Park was, was a good idea that has gotten better and a big idea that has gotten bigger over the years. This place is special and like nowhere else. And if we don't get it right here, then we have lost something truly important on our, on our planet. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is someone I know very well. Uh, she having received her PhD from my home department, Environmental Science Policy and Management, please welcome my good friend, Dr. Carol Hart, Director of Sonoma County Regional Parks. Carol. Well, hello, fellow park lovers. I feel like I'm surrounded by more than ever, people in like minds, and it's wonderful. Uh, in addition to being director of Sonoma County Regional Parks, I've also was chair of the California State Parks Commission for many years, and I have most recently served on a commission called the Parks Forward Commission. So while today we're here to celebrate the first 100 years of the National Park Service, the origins of the park movement here at UC Berkeley, and looking forward to the next 100 years of national parks, I'd like for a moment to turn our attention to California State Parks, which was the first park system in the United States, and it came into existence, as uh, Steve Beisinger mentioned, with the Grand of Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Big Trees Grove in 1864. For those of you who are not math whizzes, that is 151 years ago. And through these many years, we've seen great successes with this system. It's preserved 279 park units, uh, 1.6 million acres in California, 379 miles of Pacific Coast, 15,000 campsites, and over 11,000 prehistoric and historic archaeological sites. But we've also seen failures, and that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight because I think it's a warning for all people who love parks because in the trajectory of time, it makes sense. It's to be expected that there's going to be highs and there's going to be lows, but when it happens with a park, it cuts so deeply. And it's because at least in California and throughout the United States and throughout the world, it goes to the heart of what it, what it means to be a human being. A uh, wonderful Berkeley resident and a state park historian, Joe Enbeck, uh, said it very well in his book, that parks are direct expressions of basic American ideas about freedom, independence, social equity, and the right to the pursuit of happiness. So in 2011, in California, as a result of the recession and budget cuts, uh, the, the state proposed to close 70 parks. And at that time, one quarter of the state park system 
the Redwood Parks, the most beautiful Redwood Parks in Del Norte County, beaches in my county and Sonoma County, almost all of the state parks were proposed for closures. And what happened was that the public came out wholeheartedly with their dollars, their time as volunteers, their political will, and they really stepped up to prevent this loss from occurring. And I think to many, closing a park seemed unimaginable given how hard it is to create a park. It's such an intense battle, and, and parks are so important, and we all know that, to our environment, our health, and our local economies. But what came next in California was what I think of as kind of out of a parks horror movie, because it turned out that the state, state parks had failed to disclose $54 million in hidden accounts that they had, and this was happening at the same time, this happened at the same time, or was disclosed, that the public was intensely working and raising money to keep the 70 parks open. So in the final accounting, <clears throat> it proved to be closer to 20 million, but it was no less of a blow to park, park lovers. Now, has, as has been the case through many decades of park history, those who love parks, those who are elected to preserve a park system, and those who have the financial capacity to alter the course of history came together to create the Parks Forward Commission. This was created under legislative statute in a partnership with major foundations and Governor Brown to examine the steady deterioration of the state park system over many years and to make recommendations to the governor on how to reverse that course. I'll be discussing this in more detail at Friday at 1045, just in case any of you. It's a shameless promotion of myself. <laughs> a big part of the report, and something I was particularly interested in given my role at regional parks, was to look at uh, inefficiencies in park management between different park managers, national parks, state parks, regional parks, local parks. Every day, I recognize that the first experience many people have of a park is a, square of da uh, a squ little square of grass down the street. If they're lucky, a larger city park. If they have a good experience and they're lucky, then they might be able to visit a regional park, like those here in the East Bay, which represent a phenomenal system of connected parks that have great value to science and people. The fact of the matter is that most people visiting a park don't know if it's operated by a local, state, or federal government, and they don't care. Neither do plants and animals give a hoot about who the land manager is. People care that parks are open, they're safe, and they have a good experience. So among park agencies, we've begun to recognize that boundaries are not what matter. What matters is how we work together, how we partner with each other. When state parks were in trouble in 2011, national parks, under my, uh, our speaker that's coming next, uh, Director Jarvis, stepped up to help the state parks, and they continue to help state parks today. And likewise, we at regional parks operated state parks. All over the state, we see national and state redwood parks being operated together, the Santa Monica Mountains, and new joint management approaches being adopted just over across the bay on Mount Tam, a new collaborative, including national parks, state parks, regional open space lands, and water agency managers all managing the Mount Tam watershed. And this is the future, uh, and I'm very excited to be part of it. Now, finally, I'd like to touch on park funding, which is something that all of us know whether it's science or policy, it's always an issue and it's particularly an issue in California. State Parks has huge deferred maintenance, over a billion dollars. But the hope is now with the success of Parks Forward, with internal changes that are going on here in State Parks that we're gonna to come to the voters in 2016 with a successful measure that will support State Parks, regional parks, local parks and all of their partners and support all of the science that I know all of you want to do and should be doing in the parks. On that note, I'm going to introduce a short video that we made uh, about the Parks Forward findings and I thank you all so much for being here. Today, our California state park system, which boasts 280 parks covering nearly 1.6 million acres, faces significant challenges ranging from maintenance needs to organizational barriers. The Parks Forward Commission was created to plan for a vibrant, sustainable 21st century park system. We at the Commission would like to share our plan with you as Californians and ask for your support. 
we have come up with the best solutions to transform state park management, modernize state park operations, provide access for all, and ensure the long-term sustainability of our natural and cultural resources. We recommend creating a new organizational structure to ensure transparent, accurate, and accountable budgeting, planning, and project implementation, and create a path to leadership for the most qualified and capable employees. We will collaborate with public agencies, Indian tribes, businesses, and volunteers to improve research, restoration, youth engagement, public health, and community outreach programs. To support these new connections, we suggest creating a nonprofit organization to support state parks where it lacks resources, expertise, or We recognize that the best way to get more people to understand the value of parks is to get them out into the parks. So we want to expand park access to all Californians, especially underserved communities, urban populations, and younger generations. We call for the development of new digital tools, programs, and transportation options that serve the needs of a broader base of park visitors. We aim to give every Californian access to a quality state, regional, or local park with activities and facilities designed for the community it serves and provide opportunities for people to come together in their parks for special events. We believe in a park system that values the state's iconic landscapes, natural resources, and cultural heritage, is accessible to all Californians, and welcomes visitors from around the world, engages younger generations, and promotes healthy California communities. Take a look at our full report and find out how you can help secure the beauty and longevity of California's natural and cultural treasures. Visit us at parksforward.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Parks Forward. Thank you, Carol. Our final speaker this evening will be John Jarvis, Director, U.S. National Park Service. John, it's an honor to have you with us this evening. Welcome. Well, I understand I'm the, uh, the only thing between you and the reception, so um, <laughs> I'll try to be quick. Um, you know, uh, the closure, or at least the proposed closure of the California State Park System was a, was a hit to all of us in the parks community. And uh, I was proud to play at least a small role in that, uh, uh, warning your governor, um, Schwarzenegger, that uh, many of these properties were developed or acquired through the Land Water Conservation Fund. And that is a commitment, uh, a lifetime, perpetuity commitment that these parks are protected uh, for all people of California, all people of the country. So it's nice to see the advancement that's been done with the, the commission. So Dean, uh, thank you. Steve, uh, thank you for the great work that you have done to prepare for this uh, great summit. Uh, it's wonderful. It is in many ways the first event uh, as the National Park Service begins to celebrate its centennial. And I'd also like to thank all the National Park Service employees that are here and those that are not here and watching online. My apologies that uh, uh, Washington's dysfunction prevents many of us from attending these kinds of conferences. Uh, so they're out there online watching uh, all of this. You know, the centennial is an opportunity to reflect really on, on the past, but, it, but probably much more importantly to really take stock of where we stand today and really envision the future. And we've heard, um, I think well told, the extraordinary role that both science and science at Berkeley has played in this trajectory of, of the national park idea, the national park system, uh, both here in the United States and around the world. Stephen Mather, Horace Albright, Joseph Grinnell, uh, Harold Bryant, Newton Drury, A. Stark or Leopold, they, they were just they were lions, obviously, luminaries. When I was a young superintendent in the National Park System, I came here to Berkeley and had an opportunity to visit the office and desk of George Melendez Wright. And for me, as a, as a young biologist, and now in, with the responsibility to manage a, a large national park, this was a sort of a pilgrimage 
uh, to, uh, to this place to, to see where Wright really imagined that the national park system would be, would be managed in accordance with scientific knowledge. You know, all these individuals that were mentioned, they all had something in common, and that was that they believed that their science would advance conservation, that, that they would help us do a better job of managing these incredible places. And they spent time in those places, sort of soaking up the gifts that wild places offer and deepening their, their commitment and their appreciation and then translating that into knowledge for better management. It was mentioned, a Starker Leopold's 1963 report uh, really has been the bedrock of policy for the national parks for over 50 years. But now we are seeing unprecedented changes, and you've heard a lot of them today, driven in many cases by global warming. And we need the minds and the spirits and the commitments of the modern equivalents of these luminaries to step up. And I think many of them are in this audience or will be with us for the next couple of days. And it's really exciting to see these two of America's best ideas back together again. You know, in my 39 years in the National Park Service, uh, I've always been committed to incorporating science into decision making. You know, whether we are taking on the issues of snowmobile and Yellowstone or the flows that deposit or erode sediment along the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon National Park or the removal of the Elwha dams in the Olympic National Park or the restoration of water flows into Everglades National Park, science has informed our policies and practices and had led, has really led us to extraordinary accomplishments these being just a few of those in conservation. I served as the park biologist and superintendent of some great parks, Crater Lake, North Cascades, Wrangell St. Elias, Mount Rainier, and I've always had a practicing scientist at my side, someone for there for advice and counsel. And uh, one of those is in the room, actually several of them are in the room. I remember very well a conversation uh, with one of those scientists when I was working in Alaska on a caribou herd that uh, was very, very important culturally to the native Atna people, but uh, almost all of the, the calves were being uh, eaten by bears or wolves within just the first couple of days. And really this, we were challenged with how to allocate a human harvest that we knew that would at least potentially make the herd go into decline. And, and, uh, and Kurt, who is here, Kurt Jenkins, uh, said, well, we can answer the management question and we can answer the research question at the same time. And I was like, yes, that's my kind of park science. When I was regional director here in the Pacific, uh, um, another Berkeley alum um, was my science advisor, Dave Graber, and um, he was trained under Starker Leopold and really in some ways takes on that mantle of responsibility. It was Dr. Graber who asked me whether I was ready to put a sprinkler system on the giant sequoias proving that great scientists can also be incredibly annoying. <laughs> so when I became the director uh, in 2009, I created a science advisor to the director, the first, I believe, um, in the system. And Dr. Maklis is here, and he will be addressing the summit uh, later this week. We've brought together a group of scientists that are really helping the Park Service address climate change. Um, and the evidence is out there. Those of you that work in the field know this. Glaciers in our great western parks are receding. Wildfires are burning uh, way beyond uh, their history and 20 days or more longer. We're seeing changes in bird migration and in ranges of animals and plant dormancy. We're seeing sea level rise and affecting coral reefs in the Caribbean and our parks in the Pacific. And you do have this little drought going on here. It's a big one. So our, our climate change response program is really uh, taking this on. Um, in science, uh, produced by this university and many others, has really led the Park Service to be a leader in this uh, around the world. We led the theme at the World Parks Congress in Sydney in Australia. I was very proud to see the Park Service do that. And they're helping us adapt and evolve our policies of management and conservation as well. So, taking on, to a certain degree, the holy grail, 
the Leopold Report was uh, a bit of a challenge. But in 2002, I commissioned an extraordinary group of scientists, and there's one of them is in this room as well, several Nobel laureates and members of the National Academy to re-examine the starker Leopold Report of 1963. And their recommendations revisiting Leopold are now being converted into policy and practice and tools that we will use to steward the national park system into our second century. In January of this year, the Pew Research Center published the results of a detailed survey of the American public and the American scientists with their thoughts about science. And there were two key findings. First, scientists and citizens have a large, very large differences in how they view scientific issues, such as the safety of genetically modified foods or the importance of, va of vaccines and the impact of climate change. Second, while a large majority of citizens have a positive view of science, the proportion of Americans with negative views has increased significantly since 2009. So I would urge this summit to carefully consider the implications of these on the future of science and the role that science plays in our national parks. Last year, our national parks hosted 294 million visitors. And as I told the members of Congress when I was testifying last week, that is 30 million more than all of Disney theme parks, all of national basketball, all of football, hockey, baseball, and NASCAR combined. And those visitors care deeply about these incredible places, and they want them protected. And how we talk about how we use science in order to achieve those goals is critical uh, to their understanding of the role of science uh, across the nation and the role that it's playing in climate change. As we approach the centennial year of the National Park Service, I believe we must expand our relevancy to create a new generation of park visitors, supporters, advocates, and young scientists who will help us with these challenges. With the American Association of Advancement of Science, we will be publishing next month the best practices guide for establishing scholarships for university students to do research in the national parks. And I encourage UC Berkeley and all the other universities um, to take advantage of this and to help to create these kinds of opportunities for the emerging young scientists that will help the Park Service in the future. With our partners in National Geographic, we are planning a national bio blitz in 2016 that will bring young people and their parents and, and citizen scientists across the nation uh, to experience their parks and help us understand their current status. We've also established a research agenda around the role parks play in public health. We now have over 50 pilot projects around the country where doctors are literally prescribing the outdoors for health issues such as obesity, heart disease, and depression, and tracking the improvements of these conditions. And frankly, this could be a game changer for us in the parks and public lands community. I've also asked the National Parks System Advisory Board to recommend to me a set of sites that tell the story of scientific achievement in the United States with a particular interest in the role of women and minorities in science. So at this summit here in the Berkeley campus where really the very idea of the national park system was pondered and proposed, this is an important opportunity as we look to our second century of national park stewardship that we consider together the future of science for parks and the Parks for Science. Thank you very much. So, John, before you leave, um, we'd like to give you a small token of our appreciation for your partnership in this event and for your leadership for public lands and for parks. Uh, and to give me an excuse to fulfill my obligation as a Berkeley administrator to turn to the audience at some point in every proceedings and say, Go Bears! Go Bears! <laughs> Thank you. So does this mean we can reintroduce them into California? <laughs>
so thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we've set the stage here. The academic community, the nonprofit, non-governmental organizations that care deeply about parks, the state, federal, local park agencies, um, and the people that know how to communicate much better than scientists have any sort of inborn ability to do. Uh, we've got two days to figure out how to get on the same page. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Let's, let's go for the refreshments. Thank you all for coming.